artist style paintings in his signature style and then within these windows they come and go and there's atmospheric effects and so on you have to see it to believe it so on february 10th we'll have a panel discussion about digital art we'll then have the unveiling of tom's piece and we'll have Karen McWhorter who will talk about the Tony Foster watercolor show. So a big day coming up that day. I might mention our next art for lunch is gonna be Wednesday, February 7th. And we'll have our friend Bob Yellowlees here who will be talking about the California School of Photography. And like a lot of things in art, when we say school, it doesn't mean a literal school. It's a collection of photographers which happens to include Dorothea Lange, Ansel Adams, and many, many others who created the golden age of photography in the early part of this century. And Bob will be telling about that and relating it to our current exhibition of Perkle Jones and Dorothea Lange. Um, when you leave here tonight, uh, we're gonna be talking a fair bit about the Cowboy Artists of America and have been doing that already today. Uh, the Cowboy Artists of America sent us some of their catalogs that they had in inventory from years past. And there's a number of them out there on a table when you leave. So if you'd like to have one as a souvenir, pick it up and take it with you when you go. We'd love for you to have that for your bookcase back at the ranch. I also want to uh, thank our exhibition sponsors, Joel and Karen Piasek and WBHF Radio. Thank you for your continued support of the museum. We appreciate it very, very much. I also want to uh, mention somebody who I wish was here, and that's Tammy Fontaine. And she has been the gallery director, curator, chief cook and bottle washer and everything related to this collection for many, many years. And we could all tell stories about Tammy as well tonight, but uh, I wish she were here with us, but uh, was not in the cards, but I wanted to recognize her contribution to helping put this exhibition together. Uh, along with the Basha family, the Western Spirit, Scottsdale's Museum of the West, and the Heard Museum in Phoenix. So those were our partners on this exhibition. Uh, most of you who are on the gallery walk met the panel, but I'll introduce them very quickly again on the end. Bill Ray from Claggett Ray Gallery in Vail, Colorado. <laughs> Jody Beeler, son of Joe Beeler from Sedona, Arizona. <laughs> Jody, you might want to pull that thing out of your eye. <laughs> Help me out there, Nadine. Thank you. That's good. <laughs> and of course, the lovely Nadine Basha from Chandler, Arizona. Chandler. <laughs> and her daughter-in-law, Allie, who we've had the pleasure of having here the last three days as well. <laughs> so I'm gonna come over here and sit with the panel. Come on, we won't bite, you can move in close. You think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the splash zone up here in the first two rows. <laughs> That's where Shamu comes? That's right. <laughs> okay, we'll watch out for that. All right, uh, Nadine, would you start, give us a little bit more about Eddie, and I'm sorry, I screwed up already. Please forgive me. Uh, we'd like to roll a little video clip and introduce you to Eddie, and so that you can get to know him a little better. So if we could go ahead and roll that, this is from Arizona Public Television, called Artbeat. I'm just not used to this. <laughs> you may have shopped, shopped at his grocery stores, but have you seen his art gallery? gallery. Eddie Basham takes, takes us on a tour of his private collection of Western and Native, Native American, American art. art. It's, it's tonight's, tonight's edition of Arizona, Arizona Art Beat. Really high. Every, Every piece of art in this gallery is selected. Everything here. I prefer to select so, so there's, there's, a, there's a very, very deep-seated connection, connection to that. that. Surrounded, Surrounded by art he collected for decades, Arizona's, Arizona's homegrown grocer, Eddie, Eddie Basha Jr., Jr. is definitely in his element. element. Yeah, yeah, see, this vast collection of contemporary Western and Native American art is an expression of who he is. See, it's the essence of my life. I was born in the West. I live in the West. Cattle and cowboys are... An, an integral part, part of our history. Basha, Basha who comes, comes from a family of Lebanese, Lebanese immigrants, shared, shared his father's dream of being a cowboy, of owning a ranch. ranch. But, but instead, instead of raising cattle, they opened stores. 
Eddie's dad and uncle opened their first fashion market in 1932 at this location in what is now South Chandler. Today it's the site of Bash's corporate offices and the Zelma Bash's Salmary Gallery of Western American and Native American art. The gallery is named after Eddie's aunt Zelma. She looked after him while his parents worked in the family stores. She was good. Uh, she was good for me. And as I say, with, with, with the art, it, it was, it it was uh, her, her and, and, and her indelible hand that is seen all over this gallery. This, this is the personification of Zelma Bash to Zell Mary and, and her commitment and love and dedication to art. An, An artist, artist herself, herself Zelda taught, taught Eddie to appreciate art, and, and later in life she encouraged him to start collecting. Bash, Bash bought, bought his first pieces in 1971, small bronze sculptures by, by artist Don Holland. Holland. He, did he did these miniature bronzes, and, and, and I, when, when, when I first saw them, I liked them very much. I liked the Western motif. motif. I, I saw this painting over here, here and let me show, show it to you. you. At a, At a gallery in Sedona, he acquired his first painting. I fell in love with the painting. For many, for many reasons, reasons. And, and I bought it. But, but most importantly, it reminded, reminded me of my father because my father always wore a Western hat. But I, I love, love the painting because it conjures, conjures up, you know, know so, so many wonderful memories. As, As his collection grew, Eddie wanted, wanted to share it with others, others. So, so he opened, opened the gallery in 1992. In after numerous expansions, it now holds about 3,000 pieces of art. And one of the big clues you have is that it's watercolor paint. Chandler Public Schools use the gallery as a learning laboratory for the district's art masterpiece program. So many of the young, young, young fourth graders, they love the rifles in the back. I mean, they're really, they're really touched by the rifles. They like the rifles. The, the public is invited to visit the gallery free of charge. They're, they're treated to an amazing assortment of art. But to Eddie, it's so much more than that. It's a scrapbook of the memories and friendships he's collected through the years. Here is the essence of Native American history in America. The, the buffalo was everything. I knew John Clymer. I liked John Clymer. I liked the visit. I liked the history stories. I liked the way he described why he did this painting. Or, or what, what motivated, motivated that painting? Or how, how was he inspired, inspired with this? To me, to me that, that was a significant part of collecting. A very, very significant part. part. It, was it was almost an imperative. If, if I, I didn't know, know the artist, I was usually reluctant to buy the art. art. And, this and this was one, one of the bronzes, bronzes that I saw. It was called Up the Trail. trail. Joe, Joe Beeler, who passed, passed away in 2006, is, is the artist Eddie knew best of all. Joe, Joe was as close to me as a brother. I, I loved him immeasurably. Beeler's work has a prominent place at the front of the gallery, but, but this small section in back contains some of his more personal offerings. Letters, letters and drawings he delivered to Eddie through the years. May or may, or may not know I ran for governor in 1994. He always had to have an uh, <laughs> emblem on my car, you know. I ran as a Democrat, so here's Ward Clinton. And then there's one in Barry Goldwater up here. Or about Barry, he says, dear, uh, uh, he said, you know, expose yourself to Arizona. That's not <laughs> One of the drawings <laughs> reminds Bash at the time he told Beeler he just might bid on a painting by the famous Winslow Homer. One week later, I get this letter, this letter in the mail from Joe. And here is this fellow here, this Native American, with a painting in his hat. And here I am, it says, no, brother. Uh, you, you misunderstood. misunderstood. I, was I was looking, looking for a Winslow, Winslow Homer, Homer, not a Homer from Winslow. Winslow. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? beautiful? I mean, I mean that, that, that was, that's vintage Joe Beeler. Beeler. Beeler was a founding member of the Cowboy Artists of America, and Eddie collected art from the members of that group extensively, and of course he got to know them very well. This is the Native American room. Another relationship Bash values is his family's ties to Native Americans. It started when the Gila River Pima Indians traded with Eddie's father and frequented the family's first store. And they would bring their grain and their, their cattle and their mesquite wood, and they would sell it to my uncle and my dad, and in turn they would buy groceries. And that's why when we when we got into baskets, 
we collected a number of Gila River Pima baskets. In later years, Basha opened supermarkets in Indian country when no one else would, and in the 1980s, he started collecting Native American art. This is another great Native American artist, uh, sculptor by the name of Larry Yazzie. Larry's, Larry's always, always been, been one of my favorites. favorites. There's a true and deep, deep passion associated with, with a collection of art. It's a love. If, if you, love you love the art, art and you can afford it, you buy it. Buy it. I, I have never bought art from, from the perspective of an, of an investor. investor. I have, I have only bought art from, from the vantage point of a collector. Ask him about, about the future of his collection, and Basha says he honestly doesn't know. I hope, I hope that the art lives intact till I die. die. And then and after, after that, that, I don't, I don't think, think it matters, matters a whole lot. lot. I think, I think it, matters it matters to my, my, my heirs, my, my, my sons, sons that survived me, the family. They, they have to make, make that decision. decision. The Basha, Basha Gallery is typically, typically open on weekdays, but be sure to call before visiting because the gallery sometimes, sometimes closes for special, special events. events. And the gallery is now closed, so <laughs> don't bother calling. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, the last statement that Eddie made there mm -hmm. about that it was up to the family ultimately to decide what to do with the collection. Uh, he passed 10 years ago, which I can't believe it's been 10 years. 11 in March. Yes. Wow. But how did the family go through making that decision, and, and how did you arrive at, at where you did? Well, we wanted to keep the collection as much intact as we possibly could, and we wanted it to stay in Arizona as much as we possibly could. And with the sale of Bashes, then we knew the gallery would have to close inevitably. And it was rather serendipity uh, that uh, a car dealer, Buzz Sands, in Phoenix donated a chunk of money to the Scottsdale Museum of the West to add on square footage for um, additional gallery space. And so the bottom floor will be his collection and the top floor is dedicated to the Eddie Basha collection. So that it enables us to leave it intact. The baskets, the beautiful Pimas that you saw, also some Apache baskets, are going to the Heard Museum, which is one of the few all indigenous art museums in the country. And um, so we're, we're very pleased. We're pleased that uh, art can continue to be shared. Well, and it's the greatest, <clears throat> the greatest private art collection in captivity. I mean, if you hadn't had the chance to go <clears throat> and see it, and it reminds me a lot of what you see here with the intimacy, you know, there's not velvet ropes and and people telling you not to get close you know one of the th great things with the basha gallery was in the basha collection was knowing the intimacy you know and that it was put together i mean it's put together with great passion you know and, and care one of the things we've remarked about uh, this week being together for a few days is that when you go back and you read eddie's obituaries and you read the coverage of his passing, there's very little about his art collecting and, and all of that, where the three of us, uh, you know, that's all we knew him as. And so we thought, you know, that, that's, that's Eddie. Mm -hmm. But he was so many other things, a humanitarian, a philanthropist, mm -hmm. a politician, mm -hmm. wannabe at <laughs> least, and uh, you know, involved in mm -hmm. education and mm -hmm. so on. So I know it would take a, a whole night to cover all that, but talk a little bit about his other facets besides art. Well, he was very, bright, obviously. He had huge capacity to learn and to keep learning. You know, I'll give you a little vignette. He talks about his Aunt Zelma. She challenged him a lot. When he went to Stanford, he wanted to come home. He didn't like being there. And she said, you know, Eddie, the problem with you, you're just used to being a big fish in a little pond. Well, that kind of smacked him. And <laughs> he, he buckled down and he, he stayed at Stanford. The other thing she said to him after he graduated from Stanford, she said, you know, your, your vocabulary is weak. <laughs> so what he did is he studied every single word in the dictionary, <laughs> every single word. And, you know, Eddie had this technique. What he'd do is he had these notebooks, 
and he, we have uh, hundreds of white notebooks of different things that he'd be interested in. So one would be the dictionary words that he didn't know that he would write down. He self-taught himself Spanish. He had books with that written down. He would do that when he was on the treadmill. You know, so he had this enormous capacity. Tammy said she was so grateful for email because she would go into the office and she'd have half a day's work when she walked in the door because he'd call her all night long. He'd wake up, he'd dictate letters, you know, and that, that was kind of his style. But one of the things that he did do is he'd come home, we'd have dinner, we'd play a game of Canadian gin, have a cup of coffee, and then he'd start his phone calls. And he'd go through his, his kind of Rolodex. Who haven't I talked to lately? Because the through line for Eddie, whether it was politics, whether it was BASHA, people who work for BASHAs, they were never called employees, they were called members, family members. Whether it was with the artists, whatever, it was always about the people for him first. It, yeah. could, it could have been politicians, it could have been, could have been anything. I mean, it was, always, he, it was always about other people. I mean, he, he, the scope of people that he knew and cared about you know, was, was all across the board. You're exactly right. And I'm going to say just one more thing, can I be? Because you mentioned this dear friend. I think you did, Bill. I used to tease him. He'd come up and say, I saw a dear friend today. I say, well, Eddie, was that a dear friend, a dear dear friend, or a dear 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 friend? <laughs> if he met you today, you're a dear friend. If he met you a year or two ago, you're a dear dear friend. If he knew you longer, you were a dear 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 friend, and that's what he meant with his whole heart. Yeah, yeah. He he. Uh, we did a big book project with Joe and Sharon, in, uh we started it in 2000, thinking it would take a year, and Joe had already had six books written on him. And we wanted to do a large book to honor uh, a man, not to sell more art. It was really to honor this great man, Joe Beeler. And so um, part of funding the project, though, Joe agreed to do a painting in the limited edition volumes, which he, the plan was 100 of them, which was quite an undertaking of involved watercolors in each piece. And uh, so when he gets so many done, Eddie, unbeknownst to us, Eddie said to Joe, well, let's just fly up there. Take those books up to the gallery in Colorado for lunch. And we brought Roxanne one time, and, and uh, we went out to lunch and had a great time. But he, he just cared so much. I said, that was the most expensive book delivery ever, <laughs> flying up in a private plane. <laughs> but he, he was just like that. And, and I don't know how many of you know this, but he had over... 220 Beeler pieces, not including the illustrated letters. And uh, he was quite a prankster. And he called the gallery under disguise many times, fooled all of us all the time. And one time he called, and the girls came and got me and said, you know, there's a very uh, anxious man on the phone, a doctor from Reno. And so I got on the phone, and he said he introduced himself, and and he said that he was really worried about the Joe Beeler market was going to go in the tank and he wanted to unload his collection. And we started talking about it and I took it seriously. Did not ever think it was Eddie. And uh, He could disguise his voice. Yeah. He'd call up with a southern accent saying he was Dr. <laughs> McCullough. Yeah. You know, from, from Reno. The, from <laughs> yeah, Reno or wherever. And, and you're like, okay. So he had me on the hook, and I, w I said, well, how many Beelers do you own? And he said, well, about 220. <laughs> and I said, oh, my gosh. The only guy I know who has that many works is Eddie Basha. And I said, that's just ridiculous. You can't sell that many works. You'll just kill the market. I just... I mean, I was just going on and on, and finally he couldn't take it anymore. And he said, for Christ's sakes, Bill, this is Eddie. <laughs> but, he, but on his sensitive side, my wife Maggie and I uh, have been married now about 25 years, but first 10 years of our marriage, we, she had never had children, and we really tried everything, smoke and mirrors, you name it. And Eddie had us on his prayer list, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and he would pray for us every day. And, uh, and uh, he had a pretty good prayer list, I think, of... Oh, people yeah. that he yeah. he was very quiet about it but every once in a while he'd say hey brother i'm i'm every day i'm praying for you and uh and to maggie for maggie too and and finally we had uh you know 
the stars aligned and, and science happened and we uh, have boy girl twins that are soon to be 14 but you know we thank Daddy profusely for caring so much and he it wasn't just us it was it was so many people and like I said before when I went to the celebration of life with Jody and sat sat with the family there with Jody um, at the Gamage, it was, you know, 5,000 people. They had outdoor televisions because it was overflow. It was unbelievable, the love of that state and abroad across the country. But it, I realized seeing all those people that that was a fraction of his dear friends. <laughs> when he was an equal opportunity prankster, nobody was safe. It didn't matter. You know, he, he would call sometimes, and, you know, and very innocently, you know, you'd share information as friends often do, and you'd say, oh, yeah, well, you know, oh, my, you know as my dad did seriously one time, he's, he said, yeah, Sharon was out of town, you know, she went up to, to New York with my sister Tracy, and, and he said, yeah, we went out, and, and uh, the kids took me out, and we had a steak dinner last night, and, and we did a little dancing, okay, and this is where devil number one popped up, you know. And so Eddie, you know, the, this is how his mind would work. And he's like, oh, really? You know, Sharon's out of town, yeah, and then what happened? You know, and Dad would go on and on and on. And, you know, and, and Eddie had a way of extracting information. He didn't extract enough information to start putting together the, you know, what, what had become the nefarious prank <laughs> and uh so you know what he ended up doing you know dad said yeah you know I, I went dancing with this there was this girl there and you know and we danced and dad was kind of embarrassed you know my parents have been married 48 years and you know they <laughs> never ever spent any time apart and and so my mom comes back from new york and uh pretty soon you know as she was home about two days and this padded envelope arrives and in the padded envelope she you know she always went in, in and got the mail and she opens up this padded envelope and pulls out a pair of women's panties <laughs> and they had a drawing done on them that he had had this is how elaborate of a deal it would go he had a drawing done on them and then it said and there was a note that says Hi, Joe. Thank you for the dance the other night. If you could please sign these for me, I'd really appreciate it. My mother was slamming doors and running up and down the stairs and had locked him out of the house and was, was you know, pretty upset by it all. And so, you know, and she was like, she's like, oh, he's never done anything like this. And finally, you know, she was sitting there and the wheels started turning. And she went over and looked at the he made a fatal error on this padded envelope, and it was postmarked Chandler. And so, thank God. Yeah, thank God. Yeah, yeah. I would only gotten to see Dad on weekends, but uh, <laughs> but that's the the you know how he would his mind would work, and the thing you just little thing Dad just called up to say, yeah, the kids took me out while Sharon was out of town, and and all of a sudden the the gears of hell started turning a little bit. You know, he always said he was a good man and a bad boy, and that's for darn sure. That, that's exactly the follow-up I wanted to ask Nadine, was uh, up there on the panel mm -hmm. uh, in the exhibition, there's a photograph of Eddie, and th that saying is under it, that asked what his epitaph should be. It was, he was a good man, but a bad boy. Mm -hmm. What did he mean by that? Well, because he was such a prankster, I always said it's a good thing you are as good as you are bad because you would be insufferable, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it was because he, I mean, he had a huge sense of humor. He used humor in so many ways as a kind of an equalizer. Nobody was safe from it. Uh, his, um, you know, I remember... Nobody. Nobody. Uh, Governor Rose Mofford was somewhat of a large woman, and he would fly her around the state of Arizona for different things in our plane. And it, he had someone call her up and say, you know, Governor, we're gonna be taking off today, but uh, we need to know your weight. <laughs> she said, well, I, I'm, I, I'm not flying today, you know. She was right, rather offended, but then, you know, she would catch on to that. But there was nobody that was safe. And in a way, 
it just put everybody on an equal level is so much of that. And you, you know, Sharon, Sharon, in the whole Eddie scenario, she, Eddie was pretty much the family was based in Maricopa County, right? Mm -hmm. In the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for many, many years and never wanted to venture outside of that area. And if I remember the story, Sharon Beeler, mm -hmm. you know, Sedona had a pathetic grocery store and you had to go a long way to get groceries, Flagstaff or whatever, get a decent. And so Sharon pestered Eddie and uh, you need to open a Bashes here in Sedona. And he at first was not, not going to do it because they weren't going to leave Maricopa County and the challenges of spreading out. But it started and it spawned a hundred and some odd stores over it, the years. It became number 28 and out of whatever the final number was. That was a, yeah. that was a good thing. It was the first store in the rural areas. And Eddie did say uh, one of the strengths of he felt his family business is, again, they looked at people and human needs and uh, not market share. And so we expanded into rural areas, Sedona being the first, yeah. which I really think was his love of Sedona, the Beelers and art, um, was the first one. And that also what led him to serving indigenous communities. There's seven uh, bashes on the Navajo reservation. Cuba City and, and mm -hmm. three and others. And the Navajos want, it was a food desert and they wanted a grocery store and they put out an RFP, no one would respond. And Eddie called him up and he said, I want to be your grocer. You know, a couple of days later they were in his office and they created seven stores often on a handshake. Wow. You know, and, and, um, Basha. And you could buy a saddle. You could go to the the Diné bashes uh, up there. You could buy a saddle or a 100-pound sack of bluebird flour mm -hmm. or a lot of that. I mean, it was different from the other grocery stores. Right. It was more of a supply store than almost a grocery mm -hmm. store. I, I envision it being a cross between a trading post and a grocery <clears throat> store almost. Right. Like almost. a modern-day trader. And he, mm -hmm. You know, it was interesting to, th to think about Eddie. He, he bought a lot of art at the CA show. He bought a lot of art from indigenous creators wherever they sold their works, but he dealt with galleries. Mm -hmm. He paid retail for just about every single thing. And he really spread the wealth across, the, the especially Arizona, probably two thirds of the art he collected were from Arizona mm -hmm. artists, whether indigenous or not. And uh, he was, that money was going right back into those communities. And he, if he believed in the person, he, he didn't haggle on the price. And um, one time I, I ended up, I would always go into the CA show and I started buying, putting in for pieces I thought were great art. Well, you don't know if something's gonna win an award until the night of the banquet. So the night before is the sale. So I would put in on things that I thought were great and, and lo and behold, we ended up with a lot of award winners over the years. And there was a piece by John Moyers called White Man's Leftovers. And I ended up being drawn on about six different pieces, and one of them was White Man's Leftovers. Not a huge painting, 15 by 30, and it was a uh, 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 Native American in full headdress squatting on the ground, and there were all these buffalo skulls. And it was a really moving painting, and it won the gold medal. And Eddie, before it won the gold medal, after I was drawn that night, he came up to Maggie and I and said, if you want to sell that painting, I want to buy it. And I said, okay, if we decide to sell it. So a year goes by, and I'm going down for the show the next year, and Maggie, we had it hanging in, in our house, and Maggie said, you know, Eddie's going to ask you about that painting, and you better have an answer. And I said, well, can I sell it to him? And she said, yeah, you can sell it to him if you want to sell it. And so I went down to the show. We had lunch. Uh, Jody, we all went out to lunch, and Eddie's like, are you going to sell me that painting? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, okay, send it down. We never talked price. We never, he, I sent it down with an invoice they thought was fair. He sent a check, and he owns that gold medal painting. You know? And that was the interesting thing, too, is sometimes these pieces would win the gold medal, and it might be a small work of art. Mm -hmm. didn't have to be some mm -hmm. epic, huge thing. I'll tell you my own uh, little practical joke story uh, about Eddie. Um, happened that uh, the front desk was paying attention one day uh, here at the museum, and Nadine and Eddie pulled up uh, in a limo. 
uh, that had driven them up from Atlanta. They were doing some business in Atlanta. They got in the car service to bring them up to see the booth. But they had not let us know they were coming. Eddie just wanted to kind of slip in and see the place, I think. And uh, so luckily that person at the front desk saw them get out of that car and called me and said, hey, somebody just got out of a limo. <laughs> you might want to come check out who it is. And so I came upstairs and I saw them. And I had met you once, maybe twice in passing prior to that. And I had just enough little doubt that I wasn't exactly sure that that's who they were. And so I said, hey, I'm Seth, director of the museum. I'm glad to have you here. And Eddie, without missing a beat, looked up. We were in the members' lounge, and it says Pete LaPaglia Memorial Members' Lounge. And he said, yeah, I'm uh, Pete LaPaglia's brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, really? Uh, I didn't know Pete had a brother. I mean, somebody I had known for two or three years. He was a consultant with us here at the museum, very integral to getting the museum off the ground. And he said, oh, I'm the black sheep of the family. They don't talk about me. <laughs> You know, he, he would never let you know that he had a brother before he would talk about me. And we went on and talked a few things. And kind of like Bill was saying, eventually the gig was up. Um, I, the more I, we, this went along, the more I was pretty sure it was Eddie Basher. And he let on that he was. And so we shook hands and toured around a little bit. Uh, he was specifically enamored with one of our Turpening paintings, which uh, when you already own 30 of the best Turpening paintings that ever existed, <laughs> to have lost after another one. Uh, it's one of the things that I know our founder had admired about him that when Eddie bought paintings, if he saw a great painting, he bought it, whether he already owned 20 by that artist or not. And even if the prices were going up exponentially, he kept buying that artist's work if he believed in it and thought it was a great mm -hmm. painting. And uh, so we had, we had a wonderful time. And uh, okay. I let him know that Alouette, which we had here during this Cowboy Artist 50th anniversary sale, which is a... Uh, John Clymer painting of uh, some mountain men doing a do -si do around a campfire. And it's a wonderful painting, the light in it's incredible. And it's one of my favorite paintings. I mentioned to him that I knew he owned it, but it was not at the gallery, it was at their house. And so Eddie said, oh, you like that painting? He said, next time you're in Arizona, come see it. So I, of course, made plans to be out there pretty soon. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, the next day, right. Yeah. <laughs> not quite, but. And uh, so he said, well, come on by the house and we'll, we'll look at the art and we'll have some lunch. Uh, Tammy will get some lunch for us and we'll, we'll take, take our time looking at the art. So I go to the front door and he opens the front door and I can see about this much of Alouette. I mean, I could see that much and know that that was that painting hanging over the mantle, like through the doorway, through the living room and, and up to where the mantle was. And he immediately took me in the opposite direction. <laughs> and we looked at every other piece in the house until we finally got back to the living room where Alouette was hanging over the mantle. And we sat down and we looked at it for a few minutes. And uh, y'all know uh, Roxanne's sister, Roberta Luke, who worked for the big uh, agency uh, art auctions in New York. And that week they were selling uh, David Rockefeller's collection. I think they had a mother well in it. that was like three strips of color. And the estimate on it was $100 million. And we sat there and Eddie said, can you imagine Roberta has to go out there with a straight face and tell people that piece is worth $100 million? When if we sent this piece up there, they would struggle to get $1 million for it. He said, how messed up is the art world? And that was our little moment. And then Tammy came in and said, it's time for lunch. And I was like, darn it. And so we went into their kitchen where there's a breakfast table that seats like, what, 12 or 14 or something? No, not that many. I mean, it's all, like but eight. like most people have a breakfast nook table for three or something, but you have six Big sons, family. you know, mm -hmm. and, and who knows how many of the six sons may show up at any given moment, right? So, or others. So we're sitting at one end of the table and I'm kind of looking around and Eddie says, what's, what's wrong? And I said, well, do you mind if I move to the other end of the table? And he's like, I don't care what you do, but why you want to move? And I said, well, I think if I get at the other end of the table and I position my chair just right, I can see most of Alouette while I eat the rest of my lunch. Because I don't know if I'm ever going to see it again. And he said, oh. So I picked up my stuff and I moved down to the other end of the table. I got where I could see about 90% of it through there. Pretty soon, Eddie picked up his stuff and came down and sat next to me and said, how come I never thought of this? <laughs> so I thought that was a pretty good day at the Basha house. Right. You know, the, uh, one of the interesting things of, of, you know, in Eddie's collecting days, 
in the early 70s, 60s, early 70s, probably up until about the mid 80s, um, the genres kind of changed. It, it, it was very uh, exciting for a lot of artists to create paintings based on the fur trade. And there were a lot of people who were scholars. We had the, the Mishner great series Centennial that came out in, the, in 76, I think. And so many uh, collectors were also fans of the expansion West. And so there were a lot of mountain man paintings, a lot of, uh, of that era. All those illustrators that came out west were fascinated by it. You know, the, the uh, obviously Clymer and Lockheed and, and Lovell, there was just so many. But as, a, as the tastes have evolved over the years, and there were allegorical, you know, cowboy paintings, ranch scenes, but they've evolved. And today, you know, Native Americans and indigenous cultures have taken over the spotlight probably the last 20 years. And uh, you don't see the knowledge quite as much of the fur trade. There are many scholars and collectors of it, but you don't see as many younger artists attempting to go after because they either don't have the knowledge or um, they don't think there'll be the support for it. But I, I think it's wonderful to look at how that all of the art has changed over the years and, and, uh, in style and subject, and, and today there's more static work being created where it's not as much of a story. Don't you think that had a lot to do with the movies? I mean, you had Jeremiah yeah. Johnson and Gentle Ben and all those movies in the 70s. And, yeah. And then you have uh, Dances with Wolves and, and yeah. other movies in the 80s. Sure. And, I mean, yeah. I would imagine today, you know, keep as far as the Western love of it, the Yellowstone series and those have kind of regenerated a lot of interest in in uh, that love of the West. And I always say that Yellowstone is like a modern day Dallas <laughs> and on steroids. They cuss more up there though than they did in Dallas. <laughs> so so in, in my look at the history of contemporary Western art, you know, there were all these Western movies made in the 30s and 40s and the 50s and TV shows started coming in in the 50s into the 60s. But Western art really didn't get rebirthed and, and going as a genre as we know it today till the mid 60s. You know, is there a delay effect? And so is the Yellowstone effect going to be 10 or 15 or 20 years from now? Or is it going to be in the next two or three years? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would think that it's possibly in the next two or three years. Um, I, I think the Westerns will be fewer and farther between. And, you know, if you're under 50 today, you grew up on Star Wars. You didn't grow up on uh, John Wayne like, like I did. But... Um, but I think the modern West, you know, there's plenty of artists that have their interpretation that are younger. And I think it's wonderful, men and women creating. You know, I, I got to take my hat off to anyone who can make a living as an artist, mm -hmm. at whatever their medium is, whether they're indigenous or not, or, you know, whether they're from a foreign country and they're here painting the West because they love it. I, you know, you got to really um, Take your hat off to the fact that they're laying it out there. And the thing I, I find interesting, and all of you have a love of art, so when you go home and you look at the things you have on, in your home, you know, it might be a, a scene of a landscape or a scene of the West, and think of that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of choices made, not only of the scene or the, the original idea, but the, the values and the color you know, these artists are making incredible choices, trying to chase and please the idea in their head to, to create something of beauty. I mean, or, it may be sublime or it may be aesthetically pleasing, but, you know, they're chasing that idea. And we all own moments in time. And I always, I love what people collect because I think like Eddie and, Eddie and Nadine and the Basha family, it is their visual diary. It is mm -hmm. your visual diary, all of you in the things you collect. It doesn't matter if it's shoes or handbags or cars or whatever it is or art, but it gives you an incredible insight of that person because it really is your visual diary, and I love that. Well, and you know, the one thing, <clears throat> adding to that, what I've always said, with the exception of John Clymer and a lot of, and his historical accuracy and going to the places, most Western artists and cowboy artists in particular, they paint something how they interpret it. You know, there'll be a, I mean, we've all seen a, a million or a thousand 
bucking horses going through a breakfast scene at a chuck wagon. But I mean, everybody's got a little different storytelling. The storytelling was really important too. Eddie would always talk about Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd walk through the gallery and he'd say, look at that. He said, boy, that look at the light on that or look at, you know, the way, look how pretty that is. And it was, you know, something that would manifest, come out of, of the mind's eye of whoever painted it or whoever sculpted it. It was their interpretation of how bad it was going to be. And you go back and look at some of the, the Charlie Russell things, some of those illustrated letters that he would write of those some of those Hollywood cowboys coming off these Im impossible hills with their hat coming off and the horses bucking like crazy and and they're the the way that it made it humorous but you're like there's no way the guy's going to survive that and the same way when you look at a, a pretty picture you look at a pretty painting or or a drawing it's the interpretation of however it comes together in the artist's mind that makes it sort of important in that way so, Jody, let's uh, get back to the Eddie stories for a moment. Uh, talk about the first time that Eddie came to your house. <laughs> yeah, Eddie had, had, had heard of Dad at this point. It was er very early on in their, um, in their relationship. And, and uh, he came up through Sedona and, and Jerome, as I recall. I think they were at the spirit room. If anybody's ever been up to, to Jerome, there's a an old bar up there where you know people stop and kind of have a it's a watering hole and a good saloon thing and they'd stopped up there and they decided to come through Sedona my folks we were gone out of town on a trip and never locked the house in those days and uh, we come back from the the trip and uh, our house was was a long house and we had a big sliding door and it was there was paintings and bronzes and stuff that we had in there and uh, we get home from the trip and there's wine bottles out on the patio and crackers <laughs> crackers and cheese and whatever they'd help themselves to they'd come on and they'd come in the house and they sat and drank wine and everything and it had just helped themselves and then eddie went around and did an inventory of of everything that he liked and kind of called dad you know the following few days later and that's kind of how the whole you know connection with with the Beelers got started there was an instant friendship with you know with dad and my parents and and Eddie and uh, at that time and I would just like to say I wasn't married to him then because there wouldn't have been wine bottles and crumbs <laughs> sitting around <laughs> <laughs> right right and I, I did hear that they brought their own picnic yeah. yeah they didn't they didn't pill for your parents wine well, he did, but he did leave that. They did leave the stuff, stuff on the yeah. patio. It, yeah, and then and then your family had the seven minute drill. Oh, we had this the seven minute drill. Whenever we would get a call, and and being an artist family, you know, you know, you always had free time until you didn't, and then you had seven minutes to clean up whatever mess was going on. So somebody would call, Eddie would call, and say. We're in town. Can we come by? And mom's like, sure. And then she did hang up the phone. She's like, you got seven minutes to get, you know, showered up, get your hair combed and get all the stuff, <laughs> dishes done and everything crammed in a drawer, you know. And, and we did it that way forever. It was always a, a kind of a family tradition about it. And we laugh about it now. And, that, and that's because where the last payphone was in town, it was seven minutes from that payphone right. to your house. Exactly. Exactly. We, we, uh, the first time I went to, to Joe and Sharon's was with our partners, the Duncans, and our partners in the gallery for many, many years, almost 30 years, were Ray and Sally Duncan, who are our 50 50 partners. And they, among other things, owned uh, and started Silver Oak Cellars, the great California Cabernet, and a few other wines. And they were in oil and ranching and all kinds of things. But he was a huge mentoring force. So we had opened the gallery in 1989 in. Well, we opened July 3rd, but we had uh, a few months before sealed the deal of a partnership. And they had already, Ray had already been a collector, uh, Ray and Sally, of, of Joe's. And he said, you know, we got to go down to Arizona and you need to meet the Beelers. So we had a two month or three month old daughter. And uh, we flew down on their plane, the four of us and our daughter. And we land at the airport in Sedona, and we get a, a taxi to 
Joe and Sharon's, and it's a low rider. <laughs> and I'll never forget this. We, and so going to Color Cove, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right before the house, maybe 100 yards before the house, is a water bar, like a dip. A little dip, you know, yeah. And the uh, low rider got front and rear ended and was high centered, well, low centered, uh, and couldn't, he was stuck. So we all got out and walked. A hundred yards, walk to the, yards to the house. To yeah. the house, and uh, big greetings from Joe and Sharon, and of course met them. And Sharon had two little Navajo bracelets with turquoise for our, I mean tiny ones for our daughter, mm -hmm. and uh, we had the best time. And you know, an hour later, there's a tow truck coming and tow that guy out of the <laughs> out of the water bar, and we never missed a beat. We had we had the best time. I mean, we just hit the ground running. But their friendship, our partners. Uh, being friends of Joe and Sharon's for many years, of, of as collectors, not not brothers like they became, but uh, really broke the ice for for all of us, and and we took Joe's lead on so many things. He he would come up to the Diamond Tail Ranch, this big bison ranch they had, 2,000 head of mother bison, and Jody came with him several times. Early December, it could be. 10 below, blowing sideways, or it could be 40 above and calm. But we would spend a, five days working these bison. They'd already brought them in off the range. They brought them in once a year. And Joe would be running vaccinations. He'd have a big old woolly coat on, buffalo coat or something. And, and I'd run the crash gate. Jody would be vaccinating. And, and then they had all the ranch hands and the team and the vet, the vet there. And it was just, it w was from 7 in the morning we quit about four in the afternoon every day. And I think about that starting in like 1990. And we just did it. Everybody, Ray and Sally were in, and your dog tired, but having the best time. Talk just for a minute uh, as we finish up about how aggressive Eddie was in his pursuit of masterpieces, whether at the CA show or, or other, other well, means. One thing I have <laughs> to say, I've got to give um, credit to Aunt Zelma. You know, if, if and if she was in this room, everybody would would love her. She was she was a powerhouse and, and a little you know I I I have to bring credit to that because I remember the very first time that I met her, she was a little little tiny Lebanese lady, and she comes in and she and did they live at was it Long Beach or Newport? Um, yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, Emerald Cove. And she always had a she'd have a felt hat okay. with a with a something tied around it you know she was very flamboyant and she'd come in and i that i knew the second that i met her after i knew eddie a long time that's where he got his passion for stuff because she never met a stranger and she would walk in and ask you just she wanted to know all about you if she was was introducing herself to you how are you doing how are you, you know, are you doing good in school? I mean, it was just like, you know, and the, the genuineness of kind of the, the culture and the, the Basha family culture and the Lebanese quality to it was, was so wonderful because a lot of their customary things were, were carried across. And I remember asking him, you know, a, a, about, you know, and he said she really was one of the people who shaped him. And I, I wanted to touch on that you know, she was an amazing person if not for her there wouldn't have been an art collection right probably right, right? so eddie playing he played football at stanford right no 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 he he probably lied about that yeah, to okay somebody. <laughs> <laughs> fine figure of a man but he so he did let us go yeah he played <laughs> it in his head in right? the early days of the cowboy artists they it was uh when they were showing at the at the cowboy hall in oklahoma city it was the first person to get to the artwork and pull off the little tab, got to buy the artwork. <laughs> and so it became a kind of a serious thing. And Eddie would bring ASU football players and give them each a hundred bucks if they could get, get a piece. Well, this is early on and, and you know, little old ladies are getting run over and, <laughs> and it was, it, and, it, and it actually became, they, they uh, orchestrated the, the draw box system because because of this problem. And um, people were, were literally running and getting pieces that weren't Eddie. Eddie was buying to keep it, but there were people that would, Frank McCarthy was hot in those days and, and really hot. 
and would run, get, got, and this is a true story, got his tab, pulled it off, and it was like $10,000 painting, and, and said, who will give me 15000 And that caused a big mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. And so they, they finally figured out if they did a draw box system, it would help it, but it didn't quash Eddie's competitive <laughs> instinct to enslave all of us. He would, he would find everyone he knew if he really wanted something. And my wife, Maggie, uh, was lucky. She was, had, had the luck of her family and was drawn on several things. And, and, and Eddie, if he asked her to put in on something and she was drawn on it, you know, a few weeks later in the mail would come a beautiful little Navajo brooch or something, you know. He, he was just wonderful that way. <laughs> Didn't you tell me a story about somebody in your family having to write a big check for one my of My mother. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm shaking. I don't have this money, you know, because the person who was drawn had to write the check that night. And she said, I just, I just don't think I could do this. But, you know, but thank Eddie, goodness Eddie, Eddie had made the money good. in her account the next morning. Yeah, he yes, covered he, the check. Well, long before in the those check. days, it couldn't be the next morning. But, right. yes, yeah. it, he covered it immediately. Right. And it was all fun and games until it was time to draw in oh. the draw boxes. Eddie was, was a prankster and fun and everything until that, the night of the sale. And it's like mm -hmm. dead serious. Dead serious. We'd drive in. We'd have several people with us. Not a word. Nobody said one word. Until it was done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he'd go in and scope the whole show out. And then he'd get, you'd have your assignment, put your name in on this, this, and this. And we would do that. And then after the drawing, he could breathe again. <laughs> you know, and, and you couldn't keep up with him no. when he was looking at the, when he was looking at the art. I mean, he was like a cartoon. There was dust coming up behind him. <laughs> Let's have the house lights up. And we've got time for just a couple of questions from the audience, if anybody might have one. Anybody a question for our panel? Yes, Lynn. How many children did uh, he have? Eddie had four boys before I married him, and then we had two, so we have six sons. Wow. And are any of them in the business? The four older ones were in the business. My two were not. And Allie's the only girl in the whole shooting match, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think, um, this, interestingly, the city of Chandler is really looking at um, developing more of an ar archival approach to the Basha family and to Eddie in particular. So it won't be necessarily a catalog of the collection, but it will be um, in their historic museum. Uh, the story of the Basha family and Eddie in particular. So, uh, but the art is integral to that. But and we'll see. We'll see what Scottsdale Museum of the West. They, I think they're overwhelmed at the moment with all this art, and the building is just not out of the ground yet. So, time will tell. And there, there's 3,500 pieces in the collection. Yes. And a few hundred went to the herd, and right, like and a thousand are going to go to Scottsdale yes. or something. Mm -hmm. So there's still a ton left. What's going to happen to that? Well, it, it, most, the bulk of it really has gone. At, well, the really let, great stuff. Let me qualify. For the Scottsdale Museum of the West, some of it's donated and some of it's loaned. So they will have it for a period of time, and then the family will make more decisions about the loan pieces. <clears throat> and then we still, in our personal collection, have a significant number of pieces. Oh. But also related to that, there is a book in the works about Eddie. Yes, we've had, I almost hated to say that because we, it's just not, we haven't gotten as far along as we wanted, but we have been working on a book about his life. The thing is, it's complicated. As I was saying, he was such a complex man. So it's almost like in two parts of his life and then the collection. And I'm not, not sure how this is all going to come together. So it's a little bit of a conundrum right now. With the Beeler book project, it took us our one-year book project, which we used a great designer in Sedona, Carol Harrelson, was we were going to print it in Florence, Italy, which was through her contacts. And everybody said, well, why, do you, why would you print in Florence? Well, Joe and Sharon, Ray and Sally Duncan, and Maggie and I wanted to go shopping in Italy. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the 
the, the context of it all, and unfortunately, a couple months before we went to press, or a month before we went to press, Sharon passed away unexpectedly, and, uh, and that changed it all, and Carol Harrelson went over and did the book, or did the printing, and it won the Western Heritage Award. It was a, yeah, quite was an a big, honor. Big deal. Jody, the day his mother passed away, he resigned from 17 years at Gore Medical mm -hmm. and uh, in Flagstaff and spent the next two years with his dad every day. And I spent maybe six weeks with those guys and yeah. talked to Joe every day. And, you know, it, it was very interesting. Joe was one of the hippest guys I ever met. And at 74... He, he could pull in the driveway, pull in a horse trailer, listening to Jimi Hendrix or Roy Orbison or, you know, uh, I mean, you just never knew what Randy Travis, you never mm -hmm. knew what he was going to have going. But he, he was so cool. In the last year of his life, he, unbeknownst that we didn't know it was his last year, but at the CA show, it was the 40th anniversary and it was our partner, Ray Duncan's 75th birthday. So Maggie and I... Uh, kidnapped Joe. We went to the sale the night, the sale night at CA, and the next night was the big banquet. But we flew with Joe back up to Denver to go to Ray Duncan, our partner's uh, birthday party, which was for like 50 people. And, and the entertainment was a keyboardist for the Rolling Stones named Chuck Lavelle, who's a Georgia man. It's you know, really Almond Brothers, uh, you know yeah. Chuck Lavelle. And Chuck Lavelle is a friend of the Duncan family and, and so he was playing, and, and, but Joe and he spent a lot of time that evening together, and Joe said, well, I, you know, in a few weeks, we're going to, I'm going with my son Jody to see you guys play in Phoenix. And he said, oh, man, you've got to come meet the guys. You've got to come backstage and meet everyone. So uh, <laughs> it, November rolls around, and they, they um, uh, get a call from the Stones people, and and Joe's thinking, oh, the concert's at 9, and we'll probably have to go backstage around 8 or 7.30 or something. And, and they said, no, we want you here at 4. And uh, Joe brought his book for all the guys and did sketches for all the Rolling Stones, spent all this time with all the guys and everything, and, and just connected with all of them and bonded with them. It yeah. didn't matter if, you know, what the genre of music was. He was right in the thick of it, and they respected his art. And he inhaled a lot of pot smoke and went to a... <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really funny after the concert, after we'd been there about two hours, there, there's someone down in front of us fired up one of those special cigars. And Dad was like, wow, he goes, I've never felt this good before ever. <laughs> it was like three o'clock in the morning, we went to this all-night diner and he ordered everything on the menu with, that had gravy. It was, you know... It was a pretty fun night. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty... How about it for our panel, everybody? <laughs> we are adjourned. We'll see you back here for Art for Lunch and Gala Weekend. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>